Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the Chief Administrative Officer at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, and I would like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the events, the people, and the services at your community hospital. Today I'm very pleased to welcome a member of our medical staff and a specialty sometimes we don't hear about quite as much, but we many of us suffer from it, um, and particularly this time of year. I know with the ragweed or the pollen counts high, I, I am suffering from seasonal rhinitis. You can hear it in my voice, and um, I'm very glad to welcome one of our allergists and immunologists, Dr. Hema Dalal, who has been a member of our medical staff for, for a while now. She started private practice out here on the East End in 2002 and joined our Meeting House Lane medical practice in 2014. Um, Dr. Dalal is also a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology of Long Island, a Island and Allergy and Asthma Society, and she's been uh, a wonderful addition to our community, uh, sees many people, and we'll hear about uh, what she does and some of the services that she provides as well. So thank you for being here, Dr. Dalal, and welcome. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm um, grateful to be here. Yeah, and let's start off, I always like to, people are always interested in knowing about the different specialties in medicine, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, you know, how you ended up in medicine, and maybe um, why you chose immunology and allergy medicine. Right. So, I did my uh, medical training, my medical school in um, uh, India, at MS University, Baroda, and then after I came to United States, I trained in pediatrics uh, at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I was interested in the field of allergy immunology, um, mainly that field being more uh, outpatient and not a hospital-related right. field. Uh, so that was my main uh, personal interest. Um, and I did my fellowship training at North Shore University Hospital in Manhasset. After I finished my training, uh, my first employment was at uh, Stony Brook uh, University Hospital in the Department of Pediatric Allergy, Immunology, and Pulmonary. Okay. Um, I was living out east, um, and I got tired of commuting. All right. So I decided to start my private practice in 2002 in the Hampton Atrium. And 2014, I joined Meeting House Lane Medical Practice. And um, we have, I go to three locations. I have an office in Hampton Bays, and then I go to our location in Wainscott on Tuesdays, and I recently started um, going at Greenport. Oh, up in Greenport. Uh, okay. Yes, first and third Mondays. So we really have you all over the East End. Yes. So, yeah. And um, I see patients with um, environmental allergies, food allergies, asthma, um, hives or urticaria, eczema. So that is uh, what you see. see children with allergies. And I see also? children all the way to adults. Okay. So as a fellowship of uh, allergy immunology, we are trained to see right from pediatrics all the way to you do adults. Okay. You probably see um, all, a lot of different allergies out here on the East End yes, too. I mean, we a do. lot of environmental exposure issues. And right. Our lovely outdoor lifestyle that exposes us to yes. a lot of different things. That's which true. Is, you know, um, today, though, we will focus on food allergies. That's exactly right. Yes. And I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about that. And let's just start off with a basic. What, what is a food allergy? So food allergy is an adverse health effect. Um, and it happens when your immune system overreacts to a particular food. Okay. It would be a harmless food, but your immune system overreacts. And what happens is that um, it recognizes that particular food as foreign and mounts an attack against a specific protein of that particular food. And it does this by making these antibodies called IgE antibodies. Okay. So now next time when you eat that food, these antibodies now trigger certain immune cells um, to release uh, substances like histamine and some other substances and these are responsible for causing the signs and symptoms uh, of an allergic reaction. So a lot there and a lot that I'd like to, to explore and um, you know it's 
It's interesting. It sounds like uh, the food allergy. I, I think sometimes we think, well, there's something in the food, almost like a poison or a toxin. It's not necessarily, right? You no. said it's the body reacting? To yes, something? so uh, that is why, um, you know, when we talk about food allergy, it's a very specific uh, involvement of the immune system. Okay. Uh, the reaction is reproducible, which means that every time you eat that particular food, you should anticipate that kind of reaction. Okay. A very small amount of food is enough to s trigger these reactions. And finally, there is a potential of uh, a lethal or a, you know, life-threatening reaction. Very severe reaction. Yes. How common are food allergies? So food allergies, are, uh, there's a range. Food allergies are more common in children compared to adults. About 32 million Americans are affected. 32 million, wow, that's yeah. almost 10 percent of the population. Right. Yeah. So in general, about 1 to 2 percent of adults and 8 to 10 percent of children. Okay. Um, as far as children, about 1 in 13 children may have a food allergy, uh, 2 per each classroom. 2 per each classroom? Yes. Wow. And every 3 seconds, it is anticipated that one individual will end up in an emergency room with an allergic reaction. And then we see those, those reactions yes. here. Why, um, why more kids than adults? Is it um, just not recognized in adults? Are the reactions not severe? Or what's uh, happening with there? No, it's just, just the way how it is. Okay. Um, you know, uh, there are some uh, food allergies that are more common in adults. Right. So overall, about 170 different triggers or food categories have been identified causing allergies. But it is very important to know that about 90% of all reactions come from eight different food groups. Really? Which So what are that those? would be the cow milk protein, okay. egg, soy, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts and seeds, okay. and then fish and shellfish. Okay. So tree nuts, fish, and shellfish, those are more common in adults. Okay. And the others are more common in children. Why do some people seem to get these allergies and others don't? So that's a good question, and we unfortunately do not know the exact okay. answer. But it is thought to be an um, you know, influence of both genetics and environmental factors. Okay. What we do know is that Patients who have other allergies, like environmental allergies or eczema, or asthma, um, they are at a higher risk of developing food allergies. Also, patients who have a family history of these allergies okay. could be at a higher risk. Um, certain environmental influences, like um, you know, food consumption patterns, the way the food is cooked, or um, the timing of, timing of introduction of a particular food in an infant's diet. Okay. Um, those m are s to some extent responsible for food allergies. I have a daughter with a, um, two grandchildren at this point, which I'm thrilled to have, but nice. my daughter has told me the pediatrician is telling her to make sure she exposes the kids to peanut butter. And that's, is, that, yes. is that a new tendency or something? So that is a new tendency. Okay. Uh, that is one of the new things uh, that has come in the food allergy field. And after a very landmark uh, clinical trial, um, it was found that um, actually the recommendation now is that peanut be introduced earlier in kids who have a higher risk of allergy, like those who have severe eczema or other food allergy, okay. and as early as four to six months after they've been evaluated by an allergist, having had done some testing. And even for routine, regular infants, in the past, it used to be restricted till right. two years of age. But now, they encourage that, according to your regular food practice, you should just introduce it. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Is that true with other sorts of foods, too? Or is that so, uh, to so these are very specific recommendations right. that have been made. Right. Um, uh, but it would apply okay. to other. Not that it has been studied, but this was at the you know, a conclusion of a detailed study that they really found. Children, sounds like, develop a lot of these allergies, or a, a fair number of children develop allergies. Um, adults, is it possible to develop the allergies later on in life, even if you've not been allergic your whole life? Yes, so typically, unfortunately, that happens. Um, 
a lot of patients we see, you know, they've eaten fish, shellfish, nuts throughout their life, and they can develop allergies. And again, we don't know what sets it off at whatever age, but yes. I seem to hear out here a lot about um, shellfish allergies. Of course, we have a lot of it in our diet out here. Yes. People love to eat you know, right. scallops and shrimp and very yes. shellfish. Um, yes. Um, is that something that's very common or that you see quite a bit of? It is one of the common allergies, okay. um, uh, more severe ones, and that's why we hear of it, I think, more. Because right. they have a tendency, you know, as I mentioned, fish, shellfish, and tree nuts and peanuts right. have the tendency to cause a severe reaction, which is also called as anaphylaxis. Yeah. Tree, you, can, you differentiate tree nuts and peanuts, and I've heard, uh, I've heard people talk about that previously, but yes. tree nuts, just some of the examples of tree nuts? Right, so the reason to differentiate is that peanut is actually not a nut. Okay. It's, it grows underground, so it's under the class of a legume. Right. While tree nuts are those nuts that grow on trees, so these would include almonds, cashews, pistachios, walnuts, pecan, okay. hazelnuts, coconut. And then the other category to add to it is the seeds, uh, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, uh, poppy seeds. Some patients are very severely allergic, allergic to, to those. those. As yes. Well. <coughs> and so the, um, it's possible then for people to. Uh, have an allergy to peanuts and not tree nuts or yes. vice versa? Yes, okay. vice versa. It's very possible. Yes. I didn't realize that. I thought it was all nuts. No, you know. but we do, especially in children, if we do see one allergy, we do tend to test them for, right. you know, the others. Are there food reactions that are not allergic? Are there things that sometimes people show up and they're having an, a reaction to certain foods that's not necessarily an allergic reaction? Yes, definitely. And it, again, it is important to distinguish because you know the treatment, the precautions are different. So um, one common example of a reaction or adverse effect of food which is not allergic is your lactose intolerance or intolerance to dairy, okay. which is different from cow milk protein allergy. Okay. Oh, I so, didn't realize that was the difference, so the protein yes. versus the lactose right. is a sugar. So milk, lactose right? is a sugar, right. and lactose intolerance occurs more commonly in adult population. Okay. Um, it is more common in certain ethnicities like Asians or African Americans, and it is because the enzyme lactase, which normally digests the sugar lactose of the milk, it, you know, that enzyme decreases in amount. Okay. And hence, that lactose is non -di not digested. Okay. And so patients have experienced symptoms of bloating. They can have like gurgliness after they eat dairy. Uh, some patients may have cramping, diarrhea. Typically ha occurs about 30 minutes after they eat the food. It will depend on the amount of dairy consumed right. and the form of dairy consumed. So, Yes. And that's not an allergic reaction. So that is not an se. allergic reaction. So, no. Okay. How do you differentiate that? Like how, what's the So it's it's the, again going back to the immune system, okay. it's that involvement of the immune system that makes that okay. food uh, the milk protein a true allergic reaction. Okay. Um, the other example of intolerance is gluten intolerance or right. celiac disease. Right. So here there is an immune involvement, but it's different from the IgE involvement. Okay of the intestine and um, so the lining of the intestine is damaged right. in celiac due to gluten which is present in wheat, it can be present in barley, rye and because of that damage certain nutrients are not absorbed right. and you know patients will have symptoms of pain, anemia, fatigue, some patients may experience diarrhea, uh, some patients constipation um, and the diagnosis is very specific. It's diagnosed by a gastroenterologist with right. the help of a blood test and a biopsy. Okay. And yes. again, not involving the immune system. Similar Im to the uh, immune. Yes, a different involvement. Right. And then there are other examples of um, intolerances or adverse effects like the toxic uh, fish poisoning, scromboid fish poisoning from tuna fish. Which is I've due never to the heard of that one. What is that one? That well, scary. Uh, um, certain some some patients, you know, tuna, mackerel, or um, anchovies. Right. Um, you know, they release certain histamine-like chemicals, and they can cause, you know, severe vomiting, diarrhea. Okay. But that is not allergic in nature. Okay. Yes. It's more of a reaction. It can simulate it, but it's not. 
Right. Yeah. And then effects of alcohol, caffeine, um, certain food additives. Again, that's not very common. Um, MSG in Chinese food. Okay. So these are all um, not allergic, but they are intolerances or so adverse effects. Let's. I've eaten something, and you know how. What would be the signs and symptoms if I'm having a an allergic reaction? What would I look out for? Right. So again, foods uh, have different ways in which they can cause a reaction. So one is, and the one that we are familiar with is the typical allergic immediate reaction. Right. So right after a person eats a food that he's allergic, um, they will have, they can experience mild symptoms, like say a little bit of itching in their mouth or itching of the skin. They can develop a few hives. Right. Often it can be more severe, where the whole body gets red, covered with hives. By the way, hives are like mosquito, mosquito bite. Yeah, I was going like, to ask you just because uh, yes. I've heard people saying some people don't know what a hive exactly. is. Exactly, that's yeah. why. So hives are literally, they look like mosquito bites. Right. They can be small, they can be really big. Okay. But the typical feature is they come and go. So okay. you'll have a hive here, uh, you know, maybe half an hour later something else will pop up. So they come and go. Okay. But they can be all over the body. More severe symptoms can be swelling of your lips, your eyes, your throat can get tight. Your chest can get tight. Sometimes some patients may not have any skin involvement, and the very first sign can be abdominal cramping and vomiting. Really? Yes. So that so these are all life-threatening reactions are labeled as anaphylactic reactions. So that's one. Um, and the, some patients have a delayed kind of reaction, which leads to a condition called eczema or atopic dermatitis. So it, that is more common in younger children yeah. and infants, where you know they'll have a very itchy red rash, which is persistent for days or weeks. Can be on the face, the trunk, typically in the creases of elbow, behind the knees. And it's so, a, that's an allergic reaction. I didn't so realize, that is. I thought a, eczema was a skin. So eczema is a very broad term, right. and that's why the more specific term right. in allergy field is atopic dermatitis. Okay. And here also, unfortunately, the, it's the immune system which is involved, and there is a basic abnormality in certain cells right. of your skin. Okay. And food is just one of the triggers for okay. atopic dermatitis, but there are other triggers too. And is it um, because of exposure to the skin, or it's actually through the system? No, it is. Uh, it's actually through ingestion. Okay. Yes. And how long do those symptoms typically last if somebody's had the? So. Um, you know, eczema depends. There are some infants that really s suffer a lot. Right. And it, there are nowadays a new medications, like biologics, that are available, but they are not used in very young infants. Okay. Uh, but, the, you know, you treat them with steroid creams, moisturizing creams, and you modify the diet. Do you see atypical eczema in adults also? Or, or yes, yeah. you can see. Um, same kind of pattern. Same kind of pattern. Right. Um, in adults, it's more localized in, in the creases of elbow behind the knees. It's not as common as in children, but it can happen. How would you, um, how would you then go about diagnosing it once, um, you know, once somebody, let's say I've eaten something and my mouth is a little bit itchy or something, and how would you? Uh, then definitively diagnose that I've right. had that reaction. Yes, so it you know it's very important um, to get a very detailed history, right. and that's why sometimes you know we go over a lot of questions over the patient with the patients. Sometimes it may take maintaining a food diary right. if you're not able to pinpoint right away. But basically, after your initial clinical suspicion, uh, we do allergy skin testing. Okay. So it's called prick skin testing, where a plastic device is used, is dipped into uh, an allergen uh, solution of the particular food, and the skin is pricked. And then we look for a little, you know, mosquito bite like reaction. Okay. If that happens, that means that the patient is allergic to that particular food. Okay. So and sometimes we order blood tests measuring the allergy antibodies. Okay. Yes. The allergy antibodies in the blood test, can that tell you specifically what you're allergic to or just that yes, you have Yes, no, we, uh, it is allergen specific, it so is. it is uh, for each particular food. Okay. But, but one 
caveat here is we avoid ordering a blanket right. uh, allergy testing. Right. The reason being these tests have somewhat some limitations in the sense they can sometimes be falsely positive. Okay. So you may end up having a few reactions when you're actually eating that food and not having reactions. Right. So it's not a good practice to go out and order everything possible. Right. Yes. What would you say to somebody who maybe had a little bit of reaction and then they're worried, I, you know, I'm worried about eating something that I'm going to, uh, you know, I don't ever want to eat shrimp. I may end up in a restaurant and have, having anaphylactic shock or something. Is that? So here's the thing, and that is why it's very important to diagnose whether you do have a food right. allergy or you don't. Right. If you do have a food allergy, then the advice is to strictly avoid that particular food. Okay. Um, that's the only way that you can avoid having an allergic reaction. Because as I mentioned earlier, even a tiny bit, even one sesame seed is enough to cause an anaphylactic reaction wow. in a patient. So strict avoidance, reading labels of prepared foods, asking in a restaurant, you know, or if you go to somebody's house, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not rude at all. We really yeah. encourage people, patients to ask, you know, about all ingredients because... It does yeah. seem that there's a much greater awareness than there used to be. I mean, yes. all the labeling seems to indicate right. things. Um, yes. Even uh, restaurants now, frequently the servers will ask you, does anybody have any allergies yes. or anything? So, yes, um, yeah, that's right. So by law now, um, you know, the label has to have, other than your regular ingredients, if they have any of those eight food groups that I mentioned, okay. by law they have to mention, and if you've noticed, you'll see, at the bottom of the list it'll say contains, right. in, and in simple terms, egg, wheat, whichever. That's right. Could you just go over the eight food groups again? So that sure. So it it's uh, the milk, which is cow milk, right. soy, eggs, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, and seeds, okay. and then fish and shellfish. Okay. The reason I distinguish fish and shellfish is because there are patients who may allergic to be who may be allergic only to fish, but may be able to eat uh, shellfish okay. like shrimp, lobster, clams, um, and vice versa. All right. Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who thinks they may be starting to have, uh, they're starting to have an allergic reaction? What what should they do? Okay, so. The most important thing that we advise patients, especially those who have a severe reaction, is to always carry their auto-injectable epinephrine. Okay. So this is epinephrine or adrenaline right. is a life-saving medicine which a patient can carry in and looks like a pen or there are other devices available which actually now have audio instructions as you use it. Audio, really? Yes. And so the patient is expected to have it on hand at all times okay. and if you know their allergist would have given them instructions as to when to use so without any hesitation they to, they should open it up and inject themselves they on this they can do it themselves they that can do them yes not around yes and of course in a child you know the parents the teachers right. babysitters have to be instructed so that's the first thing to do because what that does it it buys you time right and then you call 911 and your aim is to get to the emergency room as soon as possible because right. you may need other medications, IV fluids and other supportive care. Are we seeing schools becoming more knowledgeable? I know even on airplanes, I've traveled recently and yes. they'll make an announcement somebody has a peanut allergy so they'll not serve any peanut. Yes, uh, that, that is, more schools have become very, um, you know, very knowledgeable and now I think, I'm not sure about other states, but I think in New York State there is a law that allows school to keep a generic EpiPen. Oh, they are. Okay. So in the past, you know, it has to be, you know, okay, this is Tom's EpiPen, this is this one's EpiPen, and the nurse did not have the luxury to use if somebody else uh, develops an allergic reaction for the first time. Okay. But now they can. And these are pens, obviously, that require, you have to get with a doctor's prescription. Yes, Everybody they are, just have no, an EpiPen. They, they have, you know, they, yes, they okay. are prescription medication. The doctors have to instruct them how to use it. 
and have to give them um, appropriate instructions um, for their use, yeah. One, we're out of time, unfortunately, but one sure. last one I wanted to just mention is the alpha-gal allergy, yes. which we've heard a lot about out here. Right, it, is, it has increased in incidence on the East End. Um, it uh, is a result of a tick bite by a tick called Lone Star Tick. Okay. But there are other varieties involved too. And what happens is after that tick bite, for some reason, the person becomes, uh, develops an allergic reaction to alpha galactose, okay. which is a sugar in mammalian red meat. Okay. So that when the patient eats red meat, there is an allergic reaction. And, but it's different from the others that, because this one occurs after three to six hours. Oh, really? Most yes. of them you said is So most immediate. of them, they yeah. have a nice hamburger or a steak for yeah. dinner, and they wake up in the middle of the night. Okay. With a, and it can have the same kind of symptoms. You know, hives, swelling, can be more severe, vomiting, abdominal pain, difficulty breathing. But because of this is not a reaction to the protein, it's to the sugar. It takes a while, and um, it's a delayed reaction. And patients should avoid beef, pork, lamb, and venison. And I've heard it's an allergy that sometimes people, it fades over time with some people. Is that true? Yes, so. it is true. As long as the patient or the person doesn't get resensitized by another tick bite. Okay. And that's why we measure the antibody. It's, it's diagnosed by a blood test. Right. And then every six months to a year, depending on how, le how high the level was, you measure it periodically, and yes, People probably you do. shouldn't just experiment on their own. No, I would not recommend that. Right. Right. Um, there are other foods also that uh, you can lose over time, the allergy. Okay. Um, so that's the importance of regular follow-up with an allergist, re retesting, and yes. Wonderful. And you offer all those services in your office? Yes, so you we offer stuff. skin testing, and you know, education is very important, counseling. At all, at all your locations that you're traveling yes. to? Yes. Great. Yeah, Wonderful. because it's a very simple test. Okay. It doesn't uh, fortunately need too much of sophisticated instruments. So. Yeah, wonderful. Yes. Well, I'm so glad that we have you and that you're yeah. making it to all of our communities yeah. out here, Dr. Galal. And um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I yes. just want to thank you for your great work and all the great information you've provided with us today. And we are so lucky to have you here in the community. Thank Welcome you very much. Us. I appreciate and appreciate the help of the team, Rachel and others, and so we, thank we you so much. appreciate your being here. All right. And thank you to all of you for watching our program today. As always, thank you to our friends at CTV for producing and airing this program in our Southampton communities, our friends at LTV for airing in our East Hampton communities. If you have any questions or would like some additional information uh, from Dr. Dalal, we can get you in touch with her office. Um, and also, if you have any uh, ideas for future programs or suggestions for navigating the healthcare system here on the East End, please feel free to call my office at 631-726-8555. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Good health.